Rolls-Royce, the epitome of luxury and exclusivity. Only a limited number are produced and each individual unit is made to order. They cost upwards of half a million euros, more than a house, more than the average European earns after 25 years of work. A luxury car that very few can afford, which makes the sales figures even more astonishing. Rolls-Royce has achieved a record profit last year and sold more cars than ever before in its 100-year history, all in the midst of the economic crisis. It seems the luxury industry knows no crisis. The factory at Goodwood in southern England finishes off their wealthy customer's desired car with lots of custom-made extras. The interior of a Rolls-Royce alone requires 450 hours of work to be completed, all by hand. Wood, fine leather and stainless steel are all used, as well as gold and silver for the spirit of ecstasy, the famous winged ornament for the bonnet. Yes, this is gold-plated stainless steel, which is an alternative to solid silver. This is the parallel world of the rich and the super rich. There are customers who have three, four, five, six vehicles in the garage. And there are other customers who have up to 100 vehicles in the garage. What one can say is that our customers usually have a garage akin to the well-stocked wardrobe of others. There are celebrities from film, TV, radio and royalty, so they come from everywhere. But there are also a lot of ordinary business people who have done something in their lives, who have set a goal that they have achieved and want to celebrate. Buying a Rolls Royce is also a special reason to celebrate. Of course, all our customers are united in that they are very wealthy and have made their fortunes and they now want to own the best car that you can buy. This is undoubtedly a Rolls-Royce. How can it be that the luxury industry is booming like this, while across Europe there is austerity and benefits are being cut? The explanation is surprisingly simple. The rich of this world have become even richer since the economic crisis in 2009. Each year, they've seen an average increase to their wealth of 6%. In some countries, this increase has been as much as 18%. This can be read in an article in the Global Wealth Report, written by the Boston Consulting Group. Who are these rich? How do they live? And how do they manage, even in times of crisis, to become richer? <laughs> Many of the super-rich live in Manhattan, New York. Of the 1,000 billionaires in the world, 58 call this home. At the same time, one in seven Americans currently rely on food stamps and one in six has no health insurance. This is the heart of the financial industry, the largest stock exchange in the world. Here, the financial crisis started and from here it spread to the whole world. Several billion shares are traded here each day. Peter Tuchman is one such trader. He has traded on the New York Stock Exchange for nearly three decades. He was present at the crash of Lehman Brothers, the starting point of the financial and banking crisis. Pictures of him were seen around the world. The impact was huge, it was felt worldwide. So the anticipation of that, the, um, you know, no one, no one could believe it was really happening. You know, when the market starts going down like that, the, the stress is unbelievable, the fear is around. You know, I've been here for 26 years. Besides the crash of 87, I, would, I think those days were the most exciting for us and, and uh, scary and fearful, and the energy here was unbelievable. Next to us is a live circuit television broadcast in motion. Manuel Koch, Wall Street correspondent, 
reports on the rapid developments of the German markets for German investors. The ratios have shifted totally. People used to be happy when you had made a two or three million dollar profit. Today, we see large companies like Apple who record a six billion dollar profit and whose dealers are not even satisfied with that because they were expecting seven billion in one quarter. That's not even turnover, that is pure profit. I imagine many people watching cannot understand how someone with a six billion dollar profit is not satisfied. The strong performance of financial markets recently has exacerbated the wealth divide. Whilst property value increases virtually by itself, people without property are becoming poorer. For everybody who's making money, there's somebody who's losing money. To think of it globally, it's hard to say. I mean, people who don't have money are not involved in the market. They've lost their jobs. Uh, prices have gone high. Commodities went up. Prices, you know, the cost of living has gone up. So granted, if you don't have any money, you have less money now. And if you have money, then you have a lot more money now. So that makes a lot of sense. So three months have there young young people demonstrated Occupy Wall Street. How have you found it? Everything here was blocked off for around three months. It was like a high-security prison. Many people were escorted around. Of course, it is a shame when you see young people who pay big money for their education, but who currently have no chance in the job market. There used to be opportunities for huge profits here. Hedge fund manager John Paulson made a record $5 billion here a year ago. You can see quite clearly, one can only make such high profits by entering a high-risk situation. It is mostly a risk at the expense of others, i.e. to bet against something. For example, in the case of Greece, you bet on the collapse of a country, attempting to make the largest gains. Many think this is morally reprehensible, but it makes no difference for the hedge fund managers, because they want to make their profits. They are in the position of kings. The Global Wealth Report from the Boston Consulting Group has festgestellt that the global Vermögen immer mehr concentrated in the ganz weniger reicher. Warum is that so? One can say that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The money of the rich works for them too. They begin with the capital they have. Even if they only gain a small return, it adds up to more and more. I think it's often the case that people worked hard for their money, and it shows in America even more clearly than in Europe. <laughs> In the US, almost more than any other country, the dream that anyone can do it exists. Klaus Heidegger realized that dream. The former alpine skier from Tyrol built up a small natural cosmetics company, Kiehl's, into a mega company, and eventually sold for a rumored $150 million. He then created the brand MBT with the money, creating healthy shoes with curved soles. Flying is his biggest hobby. He has just flown into the family holiday home in his private plane. Hello, Christa. How was the flight? The flight was fine. I was down in Palm Springs because it's always nice. It was pleasant. The kids are staying at the bottom, my daughter and wife. I fly back again tomorrow. He lives in a beautiful, multi-million dollar villa set in park with Hollywood-esque surroundings. Outside, a fleet of expensive cars and motorbikes confirm a life of luxury. Klaus has had both family and career luck, having a wife and three children. He has moved from being a skier of humble beginnings to a multi-millionaire, living in the world of celebs in sunny California. No, definitely not. The Tyrol is also nice, but there is a very different character here in Venice Beach, California, Los Angeles. America is unique. I think the American dream is that in America, you can make it if you work really hard at it. Of course, the options are different. The country is so large with its 300 million people. In Austria, there are seven and a half million. These are completely different dimensions. 
I think that because of that, the Americans are very open when it comes to business. Even if something fails once, that's part of the success. One cannot always do things correctly. You'll make mistakes and things fail the next time you try to do better. That's the success of the Americans. Yet for most, the American dream seems to rarely succeed. Social mobility has become lower than in Europe. But American optimism seems undiminished. There are movie actors here. Here at Broad Beach live people like Dustin Hoffman, Nicolas Cage, Cher. They are all based here in Malibu, usually on the weekend. They also meet at Starbucks. Yes, many people were my customers at Kills and at MBT. Dustin Hoffman was wearing MBT, as was Sylvester Stallone. In Kills, we have had customers like Richard Gere, Heidi Klum, Cindy Crawford, Julia Roberts. We go to Klaus Heidegger's house in Malibu, a second home in which he is investing. Those who can afford to leave their money to do the work pay only 14% profit tax, much less than the payroll tax for workers. The rich retain much more which can then be reinvested. I took up riding since I built the stables. Higher taxes for the wealthy in the US are a hot topic. Klaus Heidegger thinks nothing of it. He's adopted the American mentality, which is less composed of envy and more influenced by the belief in unlimited possibilities. In America, if you are successful, people look up and say, I want to do the same. If you drive a good car or whatever, no one says, this is a show. You have fun with it. People are supportive and say, I want to do the same, which would be a great thing. In Europe and Austria, there is more envy. I think that's bad, because it's bad for the people to feel envious. It holds you back. Jetzt würde ich gerne auf die Steuern zu sprechen kommen. Warren Buffett, einer der reichsten in den USA, der Präsident Obama selbst auffordert, ihn und seine reichen Freunde höher zu besteuern. Wie siehst du das? Na gut, ich glaube, ich kenne sehr viele. I know a lot of rich friends who pay huge amounts of tax, just as I know those who pay too little. What the Americans have, which the Europeans do not, are foundations. Charities, as they are called in America. Americans spend a lot of money on charities. When someone reaches a certain level, he must give back to the community. The Americans do this a lot. That's the difference. Lower taxes are always better than too much tax. No one wants to pay more in taxes, including those in Germany. Here, capital gains are taxed at 25%, more than in the US but far less than the 43% payroll tax that is taken off workers. The gap between winners and losers has increased dramatically, even with the stagnation in the growth of most manager salaries. In Munich, there is big money. In the suburb of Grünwald, out of every 100 inhabitants, one fifth have the income of a millionaire, the income of at least 1 million euros a year. We will now go to an especially successful section of Munich. On the 32nd floor of the Highlight Towers is one of the most modern office buildings in the business district of Schwabing. Roland Berger owns Europe's largest management consultancy firm. It is also one of the largest worldwide, with offices in 40 countries. He also worked his way up from humble beginnings. Today his fortune is estimated at several hundred million. His collection of modern art alone is worth millions. Behind his desk is a picture by the German artist Georg Baselitz. 
Germans, as well as Austrians, can interpret a falling eagle in many different ways. Since Baselitz started his paintings 40 years ago, the world has turned upside down. He has taught people that so much in the world is slanted differently. At the height of the economic crisis, Berger advised agency staff to reduce costs by reducing fringe benefits, provision of unpaid overtime, and dismissal of employees. However, he doesn't speak in the same vein today. You should not recycle any citations that may have been made during the economic crisis in 2008 or 2009. Just because the economy has slumped in the world, we should not generalize about such measures. I do not think this leads to anything. It is quite clear that every company must be economically efficient and be more cost efficient as a standard. Otherwise, people lose their jobs in the company because the company disappears. Research shows that many companies have used the crisis to their advantage, acting in ways that would have been impossible in a different climate. In Deutschland gibt es eine recht hitzige Debatte über Verteilungsgerechtigkeit. Haben Sie manchmal das Gefühl, Sie müssen sich für Ihren Reichtum schon fast rechtfertigen? I do not need a warrant for my success and prosperity. I've worked towards my success, and when at the end there is some extra money, then I see this as a result of the work's success. The fact is that the upper income groups and lower income groups have drifted apart. Es gibt da Fälle, wo einzelne Manager an einem Tag so viel verdienen wie eine Kindergärtnerin in einem Jahr. Wie sehen Sie diese Entwicklung? This is a sign of globalization. On the other hand, say you have a manager who now works 10 times more intensely as 30 years ago. The complexity and size, thus the absolute responsibility of the MD for the 500,000 or 450,000 jobs in Siemens is sizable. I do not feel it is extortionate if an executive of Siemens, who previously earned 2 million Deutschmarks, is now paid 10 million euros. Ein Chef von Siemens, der früher vielleicht 2 Millionen D-Mark verdient hat, wenn der heute 10 Millionen Euro verdient. What about responsibility? Why should managers get their bonuses, even when they operate poorly? 10 million euros a year. That's 46,000 euros for each working day. But the really rich are those who increase their wealth by millions each day, and that's without working. Ideally, they live in Switzerland, with bank secrecy and tax packages, a haven for billionaires. Uli Marder is a sociologist at the University of Basel and is concerned with social inequality. The disparity in Switzerland is especially large. Here, the richest 2% of the population have as much as the remaining 98%. One of these super rich, Ingvar Kamprad, founder of the furniture retailer IKEA, has been living in the Vard Canton since the 70s. Wir gehen nachher eben nach Ipalange, wo auch äh, Herr Kamprad äh, wohnt. Kanton Take the municipality of Epalange, where Mr. Kamprad lives. The canton of Vard has a flat tax. That is, if I use the calculations of a tax, then Mr. Kamprad, although worth 50 billion francs, only pays 200,000 francs of tax. This is more than manageable even if it is raised, especially as he has gained 90 million every day this year. Firstly, in the wake of the financial and economic crisis, it is becoming apparent that enormous profits on the stock exchanges were made possible in that time. And secondly, we can see that during the financial and economic crisis, the rich have gripped the public sector and state in an arm lock. While the state saves the banks, keeps wages low and grants benefits, the rich from other countries 
can transfer their money here to benefit from the local taxes in Swiss banks. An estimated 44 billion euros of Austrian money is here. Switzerland is a very secretive country, willing to control the tourist costs that exist in other countries. Switzerland is keen to attract people who have a lot of money. One in ten billionaires worldwide live in Switzerland. So far, this principle works. We would like to visit Ingvar Kamprad. However, the media-shy multi-millionaire will not receive us. Kamprad's wealth has grown in recent months by 14%, or 90 million euros every single day. We are here in Epalange, overhalb of Lausanne, on Genfersee. Here lives one of the richest men in the world. Yes, this is true. This is the Ingvar Kamprad, IKEA founder. Why did he choose this as a place to live? Whether he personally prefers it, who knows? But it is also safe for his money here. Because here, he has to pay exceedingly little in taxes. What exactly he pays in taxes, I don't know. But he is one of those who benefit from lump sum taxation. This is calculated according to the rent of the house. This may mean that he pays only 200,000 francs an extremely low amount compared to what would be paid otherwise, estimated at two and a half thousand times the amount. Therefore, Kamprad avoids an estimated 400 million euros in taxes a year. Is this in the Schweiz actually a thema that here one of the richest people in the world lives and pays very little tax? Yes, yeah, yeah. This is controversial. There are those people who only remark on the fact that Mr. Kamprad lives here and that he brings prestige. And there are others who say it drives up land prices, which is discouraging and disheartening. This leads us to recognize that as the value lifts, others must have two or three times the amount of francs before they can spend it. This debate is little seen in the Swiss media. The subject of money is considered taboo. Discretion is part of the complete package for rich foreigners. We are in London, a microcosm of Russian high society. They could live anywhere in the world, but London is their preferred place of residence. Low capital levies, security, the best private schools, and a high glamour industry. The hostess arrived 12 years ago with her banker husband from Moscow. She is herself a banker, an engineer, an economist, and is committed to cultural exchanges and charities. Elena Ragazina, now a publisher, is celebrating the 100th edition of the luxury magazine, New Style. Russian people in London. A glossy magazine specifically for Russians in London, with articles about the Romanovs and Pushkin, sponsored by the glamorous luxury brands, real estate and investment offices, specializing in the affluent Russian clients in London. It's a lot of wealthy people. Many of them, they have oil, gas, uh, steel businesses, or they have property agency, or something else, bankers, and uh, everything. It depends. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, probably it's one uh, now, it's very fashionable to have family in London and many people moved and uh, husband uh, continued to fly to Russia and uh, have family here and it's like lifestyle now. Oligarchs like Roman Abramovich and Boris Berezovsky live in London. As money is no object, the prices are rising fast. London has some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Before Russian come Arabian uh, country and prices go up, when uh, Arabian people started to buy in uh, London property, then it was Russian, now it's Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know from a state agency, this year it's huge uh, boom with uh, uh, Greek and Italian people, people, because they have crisis and wealthy people trying to protect uh, their money to buy property in England. Everybody thinks that it's very good investment. <laughs> 
A top investment would be a house on Chester Square. Plastic overshoes are required during the visit, so the luxury property will not be damaged. This is a wonderful light-filled space. Because 800 square feet on six floors, fully furnished, an alarm system and underfloor heating. The equivalent of 40 million euros. A bargain compared to the 100 million loft in Hyde Park, which the real estate agency also offers. There are enough interested parties. Yes, we've had a lot of interest in it, and it's only been on the market for six weeks. And we've had a lot of foreign interest from nationals from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, from Malaysia, from America. It's been very diverse. People at this end of the market are looking for a turnkey house, a house that they can move into without doing any work to it, a house that they can move into with their family, simply with their suitcases and their clothes. They'd like to buy something with fully furnished, and in this instance, the price we're quoting of 32 and a half million includes all the contents and you could also purchase all the artwork for another 3.25 million pounds. So this is the lower ground floor and you have this very nice uh, wine storage area with a range of red wines, white wine, champagne. So you would buy the wine with the house? Yeah, absolutely. The wine comes included in the sale of the house. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then you have here the gym. So this is a fully equipped gym. A lot of the Russian buyers who are buying at the moment are actually basing themselves in London. A lot of Russian families moving from Moscow to London there. Last year we sold two houses in Chester Square, two Russian families who are sending their children to school here. So they will actually live here the majority of the time. Other nationalities, we had a Malaysian family who were interested, they will not live here all the time. This will be one of several homes they own all over the world. The 40 million euro house is now sold. As this parallel world of the super rich blossoms, the disparity between the financial top and bottom is increasing. According to forecasts, it will grow even further. And current economic policies will not prevent this, but, on the contrary, contribute to it. In the past half hour alone, whilst you have watched this report, the 10 richest people in the world earned 70 million euros, which is more than most will earn in 10 lifetimes. <laughs>